Would you turn with me this morning to Hebrews chapter 8? Hebrews chapter 8. But get your fingers as nimble as you can because we're going to be moving around this morning. You know, since we're getting into Hebrews chapter 8 and since this is a special day and just a one service day, I thought maybe we would depart just a little bit from the text and talk about the lost language of covenant. We're going to get into the new covenant very quickly in chapter 8. And I believe we would all benefit from just understanding what the covenant is all about. Years ago, I had the privilege of teaching with K. Arthur at Precept Ministry. They really thought I knew something while I was really dumb as a box of hair. <laughs> and I was learning with them. And by the way, that's pretty dumb. I was learning with them. And I remember getting into the text, especially when we started studying the course on covenant. How many of you here have taken the precept course on covenant? Just raise your hand if you have. Aha! Many of you have. And it was a wonderful time to be able to get into that because it opened up the scriptures to me as we did that. All of a sudden I began to understand the Old Testament. I began to understand the New Testament. It all began to come together. And I really highly recommend you to take that course sometime. It's an 18-hour study or 18 week study. and I, I, What we're going to do today is a broad brush of what the covenant is. But I want us to understand, when you get to the word covenant, I want us to understand the depths of what it means. We'll be celebrating our freedom that we have as a country this Thursday, July the 4th. And I want you to know that that freedom is very tenuous and is being threatened the, even as I speak right now. And all I can say is wake up and realize what's going on in our country. But daily, we as believers celebrate our freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ that is never tenuous and is never taken away from us. Not the freedom to do as you please, but the freedom means to the power to do as you should. That's the bottom line of what freedom is. The word covenant will come up 20 different times in chapters 8 through 10. This is going to help us as believers to better understand what he's been talking about in all of Hebrews. He's speaking to a Jewish audience that are threatened to go back to Judaism. And he's trying to tell them, no, 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 that's a religion. But the new covenant is a relationship. And he's trying to help them understand, to put their arms around what the new covenant is all about. The word covenant first appeared in chapter 7, verse 22 in Hebrews, where it says, so much the more. Also, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Second time it appears is in Hebrews 8, 6, where it says, But now he has obtained a much more or more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. The word covenant, when you use the word covenant, that's the strongest word in any language to describe a binding relationship. It's the most binding of all the terms that you could use. I mean, when you use that word, you mean you're in a relationship and it is solid and it's secure. The history of this word goes all the way back to the sixth chapter of Genesis where it's first mentioned in Scripture. God chose this word out of human language. He took the human vocabulary and picked out this word to describe to you and I the relationship that he wants with us. In the Greek, the word means testament. If you think about it, we carry a book of testaments around, a book of covenants around when we carry our Bible, the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, and the New Covenant, the New Testament. So it's imperative that we begin to understand the word covenant. And remember, it's a broad brush. There's a lot of things we will not say today. Hopefully there'll be enough said to help us to understand. Today we want to go back to the book of Genesis where the word covenant first appears and begin and help. hopefully it'll help us begin to discover the lost language of covenant. Three things I want you to see. First of all is the motive of covenant. Now Genesis is where we discover why God created man. Look at Genesis 1 and verse 26. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He says in verse 26 of the first chapter of Genesis, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
Now, there are three things in this verse that help us understand the purpose of why God created man. First of all, God says, let us make man in our image. Let us make man, in other words, an extension of our life. He's the term our, referring to God there, is the term Elohim. And Elohim is the plural term for God. You see, God is one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the council of the Godhead, they dis- the, the decision was made to make man an extension of God's life. Secondly, it says, according to our likeness. Let him be an expression of our character. And then he says, thirdly, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let him be an exhibit of our power. Let him be an extension of our life. Let him be an expression of our character. Let him be an exhibit of our power. This was the purpose of man's creation. God wanted skin through which he could express himself. God wanted to reveal himself in man. But as we all know, God put a condition on man. The problem is that man was innocent but totally capable of sin. And this is why you can't compare the first Adam that God, that was created with the second Adam, who's the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the creator. As we saw last week, Jesus Christ is holy. He is innocent. He is undefiled. He is separated from sinners and is exalted above the heavens. He was perfect. He was unable to sin, unlike the first Adam. Adam, who was innocent, but perfectly capable of sinning. Genesis 1, God said, Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. But then in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, he said, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. God said, if you disobey this one commandment, you will surely die. Both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, there's the idea of separation in the word death. In this context, God is saying, in the day you eat of the forbidden tree, you will die instantly spiritually. Because of this, you'll begin to die mentally. You will no, no longer be able to think like I think. But you'll also begin to die physically. Sin would cause spiritual and physical death. In the day that man sinned, in that day, he ceased to be an extension of God's life. He ceased to be an expression of God's character, and he ceased to be an exhibit of God's power. And Genesis 3 tells a sad story. Their innocence was about to be lost. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Has he really said that? Putting doubt, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree, from the, of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Listen, man sinned, and he no longer was the expression of God's character, the exhibit of God's power, the extension of God's life. And in verses 8 and following, God has a provision. God promises that a seed would one day come from woman and bruise or crush the head of the very Satan. The Satan was the the serpent in the the garden that, that had deceived her. But from man's sin on, until the seed could finally come into this world, it was downhill. The first murder occurs in Genesis 4, 8, where Cain kills his brother Abel. Sin has ruined, again, sin has ruined the extension of God's life. Sin has ruined the expression of God's character. And sin has ruined the exhibit 
of God's power. Man no longer functions in the image of God. In fact, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. In chapter 6, God was about to flush all of creation down the tubes. But there was a man that found favor in God's eyes, and his name was Noah. In Genesis 6, 6, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I want to make sure you understand, it wasn't because of anything about Noah that he found favor. It was the loving heart of God extended to, to remain faithful to the promise he had given back in Genesis chapter 3. And the word favor is the word that we get the word grace from. In the midst of the terrible circumstances of sin on this earth, as bad as it was, God showed his grace and his love to a man by the name of Noah. And it's in that same sixth chapter, in verse 18, that the word covenant first appears in Scripture. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. God chose to make a covenant because of his grace and because of his love for mankind. We've always got to realize this. God owes man nothing, but out of the loving heart that he had, he chose to make covenant. He chose to give a promise, a promise of a seed, and those covenants that kept it alive through those generations. God made a covenant with Noah because of his grace and because of his love. So the motive of covenant is always God's grace manifested by his love. That's what the motive of covenant is. When you read the word covenant, you've got to see the beauty of God's grace and of God's love within it. Man deserves nothing from God, but God in his loving grace keeps his promise alive. So what's the motive of covenant? We're going to read it in verse 6. We're going to see it 20 times in chapters 8 through 10. God wants a relationship with us, and the relationship now is given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. That word covenant is going to hopefully mean so much to you in the days ahead. Secondly, the motive of covenant is grace manifested by God's love. But secondly, the mindset of covenant. The mindset of covenant. When two people entered into a covenant, they each realized that they were taking upon themselves a new identity. Uh, covenant is when two people come into a oneness. I love that verse in Romans, you're united together with him. And that's that idea of oneness in a relationship. Each person that enters into a covenant loses their right to independent living. The covenant ritual is seen in many places in Scripture, but never in full detail. It's interesting how it pops up. It appears that it was a part of all society, but we don't see the full picture in any one passage of Scripture. Even today, you can go to any tribal area in the bush country of Africa or a third world country like that, and there's some means of entering into covenant with those people. But it's got to be through the chief. It's got to be who the head is. And once you somehow are entering into an agreement with him, it opens you up to the tribal areas. Missionaries have discovered this over and over again. In fact, when I was in South Africa all of those years, they told me about what was called, and this is what they told me, the toilet seat evangelist. <laughs> That's the first thing that hit me, the, the what? And they told me how that happened how a missionary was trying to get into a tribal area, but he couldn't get past the chief. The chief would not allow him to come into the tribe and share the gospel. And so one day, a tractor trailer full and loaded with toilet seats broke down near where that tribal area was. Not only did it break down, I mean, the engine was dead and gone, and there was no way of being able to do anything with that truckload. And so the missionary went to the truck driver, and he asked him, he said, can I purchase those toilet seats? And he said, well, sure, and gave him a great price just to get out of that which he was responsible for. Well, that missionary took those toilet seats to that chief of that tribe, and you can only begin to imagine what they would use there. And so... <laughs> he took it to the chief, and the chief thought that's the best thing ever that he's ever seen. And as a result of that, he liked it so much, he opened up the whole tribe for the missionary to be able to share the gospel. And not only that tribe, he went to other tribes, and it began to be, he began noted as the toilet seat evangelist. I thought, God is so awesome the way he does it. 
But they, he had to get through the chief first before you get to the tribe. There had to be some kind of agreement. There had to be some kind of gift made. There had to be something that would somehow solidify a relationship so that you could do that. Even today, even to this day, you see that in tribal areas. God took the human custom of, of covenant and brought it into his vocabulary because that's exactly what he wants to under, have us understand of how he wants to relate to us. As far as most can understand, there were two major parts of covenant, two major parts. First of all was the part that had to do with identity. Now, this was important. This is where we see the meaning of covenant really begin to come out. The ritual was something like this. First of all, in the identity part of the covenant, there would be an animal sacrifice. Covenant was, was always very costly. A death was required. Blood had to be shed. And we see that in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. It says in verse 1 of Genesis 15, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, no one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Look now toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. That was justification by faith in the Old Testament. And it says in verse 7, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? Now watch what God does. Verse 9, So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all of these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. God was about to cut covenant with Abraham. He's going to make a promise to him, and it's going to be a secure promise. In fact, the everlasting covenants would be a part of which we're a part today. The seed would be promised to Abraham, which was not Isaac. It would ultimately be the Lord Jesus that would become coming into this world. So the animal was sacrificed, cut in half. As we just read, the halves were laid opposite each other. A path was formed. Now, this created a gory, bloody path in which two cutting covenant would walk. Once the two halves of the animals were laid opposite each other, they would enter in that bloody path with the halves of the animals laid on each side. And this is so significant because this path became known as the way of death. Death to an old way of living. And each partner was entering into a brand newness of life. They were no longer allowed to live independently of one another. Oh, no. When you get to this point and you entered into covenant, you were not allowed to live independently of the other again. You know, if we look at it, weddings are a picture of a covenant relationship, not a contract. A contract can be broken. A covenant can't. And when a person needs to understand this, and if, you, if you've been a part of any marriage ceremony that I've done, you will know already what I'm talking about. I always bring the covenant into it. The, 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 you know, the old boy that's getting married, bless his sweetheart, he does not have a clue what he's doing. All he wants is the thing to get over with and let's get on with the honeymoon. He doesn't have an understanding of what he's entering into. And what he's saying, until death alone shall part us, you know, and all in health and in, and in sickness and in health and in poverty as in wealth. And those words just fly right by him. But his wife will remind him of what he said <laughs> for the rest of his life. He's about to lose his right to independent living, and he's entering into a covenant oneness. He's entering into a covenant relationship. You see, in our relationship with God, we lose our right to independent living. It's a beautiful picture. God took this right out of human language. We enter into a covenant with God. We walk in the way of death, death to self and all of its desires. What Paul said in Romans 6, we have died to the sin. He's talking about the lawless attitude we lived in before we came to know Christ. We can't live lawlessly anymore. We've stepped into a brand new relationship, and we've lost our right to independent living. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a brand new creature. That word new means totally never seen before. He, the old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Once the two walked in that way of death, that path of death, they would exchange robes. And this was significant because one would take upon himself the identity of the other. In 1 Samuel 18, we see that with David and Jonathan. It says, now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. That's the motive of covenant, remember. Then Jonathan made a covenant, verse 3, with David because he loved him as himself. And verse 4, Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David. It's an exchange of robes. They're entering into a oneness with each other, two becoming one. And what that signifies is all that one possesses, now the other possesses. The downside is that all that one owes, the other one now owes, but they're in, they're in a oneness together. And you put this in the terms of the new covenant. You put this in the terms of our salvation. All that he is becomes ours and when we enter into the covenant with him. Just think about this. As we enter into covenant with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the sacrifice through which we had to enter. It was his blood that was shed. We exchanged robes. Oh, I love this. Christ wore our robe of humanity to the cross so that we might wear his robe of righteousness. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. How? In him. In him. And Peter tells us in chapter 1 of 2 Peter, in verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And we entered into who he is. That's why it's an exchange life. All that we're not for all that he is. Covenant, we walked in the way of death. We bowed before him and walked in, giving up our right to independent living. Once the robes were exchanged, then they would exchange belts. And it was on the belt that they wore their weapons. This is, this is a picture of protection, of security. The weapons were worn on the belt. It was the belt that Jonathan gave to David. It says in verse 4 again, Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. And you know what he was saying? I'm going to protect you, David. I'm going to protect you. And, and the same with David back to Jonathan. David, on the other hand, would protect Jonathan. And so that this was a picture, we're going to be faithful to one another. We're going to protect one another. You know the story. You know the story of David and Jonathan. Once these two men had entered into covenant, they were bound by the covenant to protect each other. And the 19th chapter of 1 Samuel tells how Jonathan protected David from Jonathan's own father, Saul. Why? Because they were in covenant. And covenant meant something. We've lost the language of covenant. We protect him. He protects us. We protect one another because not only are we in covenant with him, we're in covenant with each other. And we, we don't get it anymore. We protect each other. I loved it when my son was working with me on staff at Hoffmantown. He would call me and say, Daddy. He said, I said, hey, Stephen, how you doing? He said, I just want you to know I've got you back. I've got you back. Nothing could have meant any more to me than that. It's exactly what it means. I've got you back. And the Lord Jesus has our back, by the way. When Satan accuses us in heaven, he said, throw him out. I solved that case at the cross. Christ becomes our protection. We're now his property. In the New Testament, Saul, who later became Paul, Saul of Tarsus, later became Paul the apostle, was on his way to Damascus to arrest and persecute Christians. And Christ met him on that road. I love what he says to him. When Paul saw him, Christ said in Acts 9.3, as he was traveling, it happened that, that as he was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I imagine Saul said, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting them. Listen, here's the point. You mess with them and you mess with me because we're in covenant together. And that's what covenant is. You watch each other's back. Once the belts were exchanged, they were exchanged names. Two became one. We see this in the New Testament when the disciples were called Christians, Christians, first at Antioch. 
Acts 11, 26, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. We exchanged names. We were Christians. We carry his name with us. I know when Dinah and I got married, I really messed her up. She was Dinah Barker. And so now she's Dinah Barker Barber. <laughs> Changed name. It's funny. When she was growing up, they called her Barber. When I was growing up, they called me Barker. I thought, that's kind of an interesting twist on life. Christians. Let me tell you this. In Genesis 15, it was not Abraham. It was not Abraham. It was Abram. His name wasn't changed until later. It, in verse 1 of Genesis 15, after these things, a word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And it was in chapter 17 that Abram became Abram. We say Abraham, just as, and we'll probably use that, use that even today. But it was Abraham. It was the Yahweh sound of God. Abram took on himself God's name because he was now in covenant with God. And it says in Genesis 17, 5, he says, No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. And then God said in verse 15, said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but you shall call her Sarah shall be her name. Because you're in covenant with me, and you have believed me, and it's been accounted unto you as righteousness. And I have promised to you the seed that would come one day that would redeem the world. Covenant is when two have entered into oneness. That's what covenant is. They enter into a new identity. They're bound into an agreement that cannot be broken. So the motive of covenant is grace manifested by God's love. The mindset of covenant is oneness. When two become one. I love it, what it says in Ephesians 4. It doesn't say to produce the unity in the church. It said preserve it. Because in Christ we're already one. Did you know that? Did you know that? And if somebody gets out of sorts, if somebody's not out of sorts with you, they're out of sorts with God. Because we are to preserve it in the bonds of peace. Well, the third thing, the message of covenant. So lasting relationship is the bigger message. The sobering part of covenant is what happened next. Now remember that way of death. Remember where they are. Once the robes were exchanged, the belts were exchanged, the names were exchanged, then they would cut the wrist of the two entering into covenant. I've been trying for years to get a couple to actually do a covenant wedding, but I can't get any of them to agree because the cutting of the wrist gets a little messy. They would cut the wrist of each. Can't you just see the picture? Would this be sobering or not? You're standing there in the path of death, lying on either side of you is what it cost for you to enter into that covenant. There had to be a death. There had to be a death. And standing there wearing each other's robe, wearing each other's belt, they would cut their wrist. Why would they do that? Because as Leviticus 17.11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so their wrists were cut. They would put their wrists together, and they would tie the wrist with a, with a rope in a figure eight. Now, if you do a nine, it's over when you drop the, 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 the back stem of it down. But when you do an eight, it just keeps on going. It's a picture of the in everlastingness of that covenant. Eight represented infinity. This covenant would last as long as both of them could live. In this position, obviously facing one another, the vows were taken. Oh, I think every one of us would understand a little bit more about what we're, the relationship we're in if we could just visually understand it. The covenant vows were taken in that sobering place, in that way of death, understanding you're entering into a oneness, understanding you're leaving your right for independent living. All of us bowed, bowed and vowed before God when we entered into covenant with him through the Father, through the Lord Jesus. In Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We bowed and we vowed before him. We confessed him as our Lord. Once the vows were said, they would put a powder into the cut so that when it healed, it formed a scar. Oh, man, what a picture. Mephibosheth was sitting there at the table of David, and David, I'm sure, Mephibosheth, you can't tell a cripple when he's sitting at the table. 
when Mephibosheth had been crippled when David took over the kingdom and, and Jonathan, that was a son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth was, and, and Jonathan was killed and Mephibosheth was in the nursery and the nurse took him to run out and she fell on him and crippled him. And he was put in a place called Lodibar. And Lodibar means a place with a desert place, a place without pasture. Can't you believe, understand how he grew up constantly, constantly, constantly hating David who had done this to him. And then one day there was a knock on his door because David had said, is there anybody of the, of the sons or family of Jonathan that I can show kindness to? And his old servant said, yes, there's a, he has a son by the name of Mephibosheth. He said, go get him and bring him to me. And that old soldier walked up and knocked on that door and Mephibosheth had hobbled to the door, crippled as he was, and he took him to the palace. And the scripture says he fell down as a dead dog when he got in the presence of David. And so he couldn't understand what was happening. And David said, because of your daddy, he says, I'm a, we're going to sit at my table. You're going to sit at my table. And so he was sitting there at the table. Ziba walks by the servant and slave and said, hey, you don't deserve to be sitting here. And it was like he understood that. But all of a sudden, David reached out and said, pass the biscuit. And as he reached to take the biscuit, there was a scar on his wrist. And suddenly it began to dawn on Mephibosheth how he could have any privilege to sit at the king's table because his daddy had cut covenant with the king. Now you've got to look at, at the king David as being a picture of God the Father and look at the Lord Jesus as being a picture of Jonathan, the only one of the house of Saul that could walk in perfect harmony with the father. And it was through the son that now he could sit at the table. And every privilege we have in our Christian life is not because of us. It's because of what Jesus has done for us. And if you're in covenant with him, you can sit at his table. You can walk in his presence. You can fellowship with him in the word of God. That mark was something else. It's kind of like, you want to fight me, buddy? You ever hear that when you was growing up? You want to fight me, buddy? He's me, buddy. <laughs> I always picked the biggest guys I could find. There were five of us that grew up in the same neighborhood. I was the shortest and the smallest of the five. And I'll just leave it to your imagination, the size of these guys that I grew up with. And I love being with them. You want to fight me, buddy? He's me, buddy. Kyle Ward, 6'9", weighed about 260 in high school. It was amazing. We'd all get into a car. It was like, how? But we did. <laughs> I remember one time they threw a snowball in our car, and he slammed on the brakes and slid. And we all got out, and the guy offered us money. If we wouldn't hurt him. It was awesome. We were all broke anyway. The mark on us. You know what the mark on us is? It's not a scar. It's not a visible scar. It's the Holy Spirit of God living within us. You see, when the Spirit of God comes within you, He marks you. And now you are one of God's children. And you're in fellowship with the King. You're in fellowship with Him. And you've lost your right to independent living. And now you learn to, to trust Him in everything of life. And you walk in that oneness that only He can bring to you. Once this part of the ceremony was over, they would give a gift, a covenant gift. It's, it's amazing what they would do. Sometimes it would be a flock of sheep. Wouldn't that be great to have a covenant wedding today? <laughs> Wouldn't you love to have a flock of sheep? Or sometimes it would be seedlings that they would plant, trees to remind them. We do in a marriage today, we put a ring on just to remind us. They would give gifts. But you know, in the Christian, in the covenant we have with God through the Lord Jesus, we have been given gifts. And when we bow before the Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize his presence and we begin to realize it through the gifts he's given, through the ministry that he gives, and through the effects that only he can produce. Then there would be a meal to celebrate. We see this at weddings where the groom feeds the cake to the wife. Same thing. It came right out of this old ancient ritual. But what a picture. What a reminder. We have a meal periodically called the Lord's Supper. And what do we do in that Lord's Supper? We remember the covenant that we have entered into with the God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. So after instructing the believers at Corinth about the Lord's Supper, Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, who was our sacrifice, that we entered in through until He comes. Now once this had been done, after all of this had taken place, there would be a pronouncement, just like at a wedding. But they would pronounce one another, friend, friend. You're in covenant now. And not only do you love somebody, but you like them. You're friends. God's our friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. And I had a person come to me one time in another place, in another city, in another church, and he said, that song is heresy. 
what, what right do we have for calling ourselves a friend of God? And I said, are you kidding me, brother? When we entered into covenant with God, that's one of the covenant words. We became a friend to God. We're not enemies to him anymore. Jesus said in John 15, 14, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Now they're in a covenant relationship with each other. And it could not be broken. So in every covenant you see, that's the ultimate goal of that covenant. First of all, its motive is grace and love. Its mindset is oneness. Its message is a binding relationship. But I want to tell you, only in Christ do we find the finally to find the perfect covenant. You, you'll see other covenants that were given, and you understand the binding of the language, but men broke it, and men broke it, and men broke it. But in the covenant we have with the Lord Jesus, we can't break it. Because remember the covenant that he made with Abram, Abraham uh, in Genesis 15 when he, when he told him, he, he put him to sleep. Most covenants are too valuing to one another. But in the covenant of grace, which we're a part of today, he put Abraham to sleep. The whole covenant is based on what God has done, not on what we do. And so, as we see in Hebrews, he becomes our anchor. It's not about us doing for him. It's about him doing through us as we yield to him. It's not about us holding on to him it's about us understanding he's holding on to us that's the new covenant relationship it's the perfect covenant there's no other perfect covenant except the one that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ that's the relationship we can have in him so he says in Hebrews 8 6 but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Now, it could have been in context. If you were a Jew in that day, you want to go back to Judaism? Is that what you want? <laughs> it's like today. You want religion? Is that what you want? You want a set of rules that you can check every day to see whether or not you're spiritual? Do you want to try to measure yourself according to what God requires? Is that what you want? Or would you rather walk in the relationship you have with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is secure, which is perfect, which is a covenant of oneness where we are friends of God and not his enemies. Well, I just thought maybe that might help us a little bit. When we get to verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 1, we'll get there someday <laughs> as we get into Hebrews. Understand what a covenant is. Man, you hear the word covenant, it ought to perk your ears up. Whoa, whoa. That's the most serious relationship you can have. That's binding to where nothing can break it. Nothing can. On earth, the covenants we have, death parts us. But not in this covenant. No, sir. Because he now is eternal life. And he living in us is eternal life. That's what it's all about.